afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to introduce our guest this afternoon, Claire Hill. She is from the University of Lund. Uh, she is an Australianist and an Australian. Uh, she has worked uh, doing a lot of language documentation uh, for the last, I'm not so uh, 16 years. Uh, so she has uh, documented or participated in documentation projects covering five different languages, mainly uh, in Cape York Peninsula. And so this is the north and east of Australia. But this latest project that she's going to tell us about today actually is completely uh, at the other end oh, of the country. I'm talking about Cape York. Oh, Cape York. Yeah, okay. I'm not talking about the new stuff. Okay. But I am working in the Western mm -hmm. So her interest is in semantic typology. Uh, and she's interested in how uh, semantic categorization can illuminate, I'm reading out, so I'm sure to get it straight. So how semantic ca categorization can illuminate the relationship between language, culture, and cognition. And she has been part of a big project based at Max Planck Institute uh, on these topics. And now she's also part of a documentation project, uh, this uh, project interested, based at Lund University, interested in uh, the relationship between landscape and language. And so she's taking us for a drive uh, in the country mm -hmm. with Nandila and Kuku Yao. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, um, Candida. It's lovely to be here and I am taking for you for a drive uh, with the speakers, the last speakers of this uh, language group in Cape York Peninsula. Um, the project is sort of uh, a mix of um, a recent work done at Lund University under a large scale both documentation and descriptive project and also work from an older um, ELDP funded documentation project. So it's sort of a meeting of old and new work. Um, and uh, yes, I've got a very long double barrel title there but basically it's language documentation in a moribund language situation, um, looking at landscape categorization. So let's go on this drive. Oops. No. All right. So um, one of the many challenges of a moribund language situation or a severe endangerment situation is recording spontaneous language use in relatively natural social settings. Himmelman, in his 1996 paper, uh, set out a very well-known program of recording uh, many types of degrees of spontaneous language material. Um, but this material, particularly down towards the more spontaneous end of the spectrum, remains often elusive in the more challenging language loss situations, though it is this material in particular that has the most value um, for true language revitalisation work and it also has the value of um, really aiding when working with speakers of many different levels of proficiency, uh, much more so than perhaps traditional methods like grammatical elicitation or um, grammaticality judgments. And uh, this point was made by Grinvold in a 2003 paper, recreating some social context for natural language use can lead to improved fluency and open up the possibility of good language recordings. And it's this opening up the possibility of good language recordings and creating such scenarios as that, um, which has been one of the challenges in this setting that I've worked predominantly in, as Candide said, in the northeastern coast um, of Australia in an area called Cape York Peninsula. And the area I've worked is shown in this highlighted um, area. And you can see that it's not far from PNG in Indonesia. And uh, we'll zoom in a little bit on the coastline so you can see uh, a little bit more clearly. The two varieties I've worked most predominantly with in this group are uh, Umpala and Kukiya'u. Kukiya'u is shown by the circled area in the north um, of this sort of highlighted area that shows the wider linguistic socio group associated with these varieties. And Umpala is the orange circle in the south and then that star in the middle is Lockhart River and that's the community where most of these um, people from this region settled. Um, and for those with a bit of an Australianist back background, uh, 
It's a middle Pumman group, which means it groups with Wick Munken and well-known Wick varieties on the West Coast. And when the work um, that I'm going to speak about was done, there were five good speakers left of these two dialects, uh, three Umpala speakers and two Kukiatu speakers, and now there's one Kukiatu speaker left. So very much at the end of its life. And uh, the vernacular now in the community is an English lexifier Creole that bears a striking resemblance to um, Torres Strait Creole, unsurprisingly, given its proximity to the Torres Strait and lots of interaction up and down that coastline. Okay, so the work I'm going to talk about today was um, the recordings were part of an endangered language documentation project. Uh, that was a collaborative project between five linguists working in the area, each working in a different Pumman language setting. And during this project, I wanted to record a really wide range of data, and I wanted to get more of that natural sort of spontaneous material I was talking about. And I started recording road trips with speakers. It's because I was totally fascinated by the interactions that went on in the car. So they were day trips to a per certain site or a drive to a camp or just a small outing. And I noticed that people, you know, would negotiate, the speakers would negotiate the trip. Um, they would talk about what resources we'd get and where we'd stop and there'd be lots of conversation about it. And I just thought, wow, this is great. I'm going to rig up the car, which I did. And it was quite successful. I had a couple of microphones, a couple of recorders, <laughs> and mostly it worked really well. Um, and one of the reasons that spurred me to do this is because it was a context where naturally this micro speech community was very active because the speakers were in a majority <laughs> in the car and um, they were less self-conscious than they were around the community of choosing the traditional la language option from their repertoire mm -hmm. because it was perhaps less exclusory than it was in the community setting because there, there was family members that often had limited to no proficiency in the traditional language and they might have felt a bit self-conscious. Um, but a warning about these recordings, they're not a monolithic, homogenous record of the traditional language because that traditional variety is just one of several varieties within the speaker's repertoire and they're selecting all of them throughout. So there's a mix of the traditional variety, there's the Creole and there's a Mission English which is typical of people of this era to speak. Um, but despite this complication, and it is a complication because I still don't quite know that relationship between the traditional variety and the Creole and, and the combination of those sort of substrates falling, falling into the Creole or even the organisation of the mixing. So there's all this richness and difficulty that comes with this. But it's really worth it because before these recordings, there were almost nothing that you could call natural language recording. And what I discovered, of course, is one of the wonderful things about these recordings is are packed full of landscape language content. People were very much oriented to the world around them and um, it was fantastic. <laughs> um, so I'd done work on landscape before, but it was much more sort of lexicographical work using archival records from the 70s, lists of place names recorded by anthropologists, plant names, and you know, I recorded vernacular definitions and illustrative examples to feed into the dictionary, and that was all great, but anyone that's done this type of work, not in situ, will know it's really unsatisfactory way to work. And if you work with maps, with people that aren't familiar with maps, there's only so far you can go. Like, we look like we're being productive there, but it's got some problems. <laughs> um, so what these recordings gave me is landscape categorisation on the go. I could see what people are actually attuned to and what resources, linguistic resources, they used to talk about these aspects of the natural world that they were attuned to. Um, and this data gave me access to really look at this and uh, think about those sort of questions. And very quickly, I started thinking as I was getting into the landscape stuff, well, what is the nature of landscape as a domain? Uh, in familiar European languages, there is a category like um, geography or landscape that speakers appeal to. Um, but is there such a thing in other language systems? Is landscape a domain much like classic semantic domains like kinship or anatomy or folk biology? Um, 
So are there general design principles that organise it as a domain? Is it a discrete entity? Or is it more difficult that? Is it connected to other domains inextricably sharing semantic categories and organisations? So I started to wonder about this question and it's answering this question that's the main thing of this talk. And um, there's a lot of varying cross-linguistic evidence uh, about this in other languages. So the sort of jury's out on, on how languages pattern whether you know, landscape does largely hold as a proper semantic domain across many language systems or not. So just two data points. Um, uh, Nicholas Brunholt working on Jahai and Aslian language of the Malay Peninsula has found semantic templates that organise landscape domain. But then on the Nay side, Thomas Whitlock, who's worked on um, Haikom, a uh, hunter-gatherer language in Namibia, has found that it's an artificial domain and largely um, uh, uh, when you look at the categories, they're actually borrowed from things like settlement and migration and ethnicity and they're not sort of organised by themselves. So um, there's varying evidence. So let's see what happens in Umpala and Kukia'u. So I'm going to zoom in on one particular road trip recording that I made and it's a road trip from the settlement where people live these days to the original place, old mission settlement, where um, they were taken to when they were forcibly removed from their country in the 1920s and 30s. And it's called Puchi Wuchi, that's the traditional language name, um, uh, but most people call it old mission or old site. Um, so a few details about this particular trip. It's a day trip. There were three speakers, several, there were two cars and several drivers cycling throughout those two cars. A grandson of one of the speakers, an art centre coordinator and myself. It was a two and a half hour, two hour and 15 minute car journey of approximately 70 kilometres. It's a bit slow going in parts. The recording was made in August of 2008. And as I said, it's a familiar territory, a sort of return to home trip, if you like. They hadn't been there for three or four years. And as I've already flagged, it's a mix of the traditional language, Creole and Mission English. So here are the speakers in the back seat of the car. Uh, Dorothy Short, an Umpala speaker, Elizabeth Giblet, an Umpala speaker, and Susan Pascoe, a Kuhiatlu speaker. Here's a little map showing the trip we're gonna do. You can see we do a lot of river crossings. Um, so the star at the top is the contemporary settlement and the star down here is the old mission site that we're travelling to. And what I'm going to do in this talk is just zoom in on some vignettes from this recording and this just roughly shows um, where we're going to end up on the, the trip as I go through these vignette, vignettes. So what sort of territory are you moving through? Well, it's pretty spectacular as you can see from the photos, and it's highly varied as well. Um, there's a real patchwork of ecosystems here, tropical savannah a little bit further inland, wetland systems near the coast, sand beaches running along the coast. And in particular, um, we do lots of river crossings, several large river systems we cross and their tributaries. So there's a lot of wetlands. Um, we also cross the Great Dividing Range, which is a major um, mountain range that runs along the east coast of Australia. Um, so, uh, this is the first little vignette or fragment we're going to look at. Um, not long into the trip, actually just one minute after I turn on the recorder, which is about eight kilometres out of Lockhart River, um, Elizabeth says, Nachi Laka, getting old now. Now, I gave you a handout that has the transcripts of the fragments on it. It's not necessary to look at it, but if you want the interlinear glossing, given there's a mix of stuff going on um, in these, then you can, but it's also fine to follow without. So, Nachi is the word for place or country. Laka is a pathos suffix. So, it means place, poor place, getting old now. And I'll just, I'm going to play some of the clips so you get a sense of the flavour of the recording. This one's particularly bad. So you can just hear it. Nachi Laka getting old now. Hey, Dorothy says Nachi. And then actually later, 34 minutes later, you see in the, the bottom box, uh, Elizabeth says something quite similar again. Nachi, old man Laka now, after they talk about the place looking strange and unfamiliar. 
Um, so old man country now, poor old man country now. Now this expression, old man country, is part a set of expressions that refer to um, that classify the environment based on state and reclassify it based on state as it changes. So it's not about a fixed stable classification system, it's about a changing set of states. And there's a number of these sort of state of place locutions. This Nachi Chilpu, old man place, is the only one that refers to human neglect. And so speakers talk about it being a state um, where land has become degraded from lack of attention paid by appropriate um, people. And this might be lack of use of resources, lack of visitation and carrying out ceremonies um, in the right places, lack of burning off and that burning off fire work helps to regenerate the land. So the lack of all this work and visitation leads to this state called Nachi Chilpu, old man state. Now the other um, state of place locution, sorry guys, I know I keep standing in front of the thing for people on this side. Um, the other change of state locutions do not express non, their non-human influence change, so it's not human neglect. They're more about things like um, uh, a cyclone comes and it damages the vegetation. Um, or there's a change in tides and there's a lot of debris on the beach and now it's called turned around country or rubbish country or the shape of the coastline changes due to a storm and, and people use one of these um, other change and negative other change of state terms but I haven't been able to tease apart the precise difference in the meaning between these terms but one thing I can say is there's not a similar set of terms for positive um, state of place um, thing. So I'm just going to look at two quotes that sort of um, <coughs> illustrate the human behaviour associated with neglected places <coughs> versus non-neglected places. Now a neglected place is viewed as threatening and wild and people approach it very carefully and they might make apologies to the ancestors associated with that place. They might quickly start hunting or quickly praise the resources available there. And um, this quote is from an anthropologist that worked in the region in the 1970s and he recorded an old man returning to a place after many years and, and what he said to that place and it sort of captures some of the emotion and the quality of people's um, relationship to these neglected places. Poor old country, he exclaims. What's the matter? No one been look after you. We're old people now. Look at that monkle, river mouth. Proper wild, no matter Pula. Pula's the word for father's father, so he's calling out to his ancestor, calling the land as his ancestor. I come back now, I don't forget, you hear my voice. And in contrast, good places, which are just simply referred to by the expression Naji Mintha, which is just place, modified by the regular adjective good, um, is a place that is positive, that is ready for human use, right for human use, and also currently often frequently being used by humans. And those two things are obviously connected. And, and Dorothy, when I talked to her about what a good place is, this is what she said. Um, and this sort of illustrates it as well, this sort of right for human use that makes a place good. Good place, place. like you, like say you go camp. Say you might go out bush camp Wachi, which is the name of a place. You might go out camp at Martin Creek. Maybe we go talk. We will go to Wachi, she says. Now it becomes good. It has good sand for camping. So notice she says now it becomes good. She goes on to say like good sand, like good place for camp, like good spot for fishing. We go there and we make it come Good. So a good place is a place that's ready for human use, right for it, but also made further good by that use. And this making country come good is, as we go into this recording, is much of what I think the women are doing in the car. They're tending to the landscape. They're fostering and maintaining their relationship to it by displaying their knowledge of it. And this is what um, an anthropologist that's 
um, did extensive work in Central Australia, has talked about as the corporeal connection between humans and land in many Aboriginal cultures. Places are perceived as alive, sentient and knowing. Places sense people just much as people sense them. And so let's look more at this making them come good that the women do um, throughout the talk. Um, I said earlier that I was interested in the relationship between uh, the landscape domain and other semantic domains and possibly shared linguistic resources. Now, there are a number of other ways that human and land are tied together semantically. So recall that word chilpu, old man. That's just a regular human classificatory term for old man. And there's a full set of human classificatory terms that divide up all the social world um, into maturation and status classification categories. Um, and we don't see exactly the same, that there's no other of these human classificatory terms used elsewhere in the landscape domain, but we do see them used for animals in a sort of related way. So we see that the same semantic distinctions we get in the human classificatory system are played out for key animals. So it's shared taxa across humans and key animals, dugongs, turtles, kangaroo, emu and sun duck types. Um, there's also a number of ways of which there are human land kin relationships. Um, so humans and land are put in a kin relationship together with use of the regular kinship system. So for instance, land, like owned land estates are referred to as na chipula, country from father's father, no surprise there, they're patrilineally owned. This meta label refers to that patrilineal connection. But as we've also seen in that earlier quote, they can be direct, 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 addressed directly as they are kin. No matter, Pula, I'm back here in this spot. Um, totems, which are inextricably connected to various places and tracts of land, can also be addressed as kin. Hey, Yapu, which is older brother. Me here. This country belonged to we two fella. So it's highlighting that connection between that person and that bit of land, and they are in this relationship together. There's also a moiety system that classifies all humans, and it's used to um, gather very social behaviour and marriage laws. Um, they're called Kuyan and Karpai, but they also map across all land estates. Every land estate is called either Kuyan or Karpai, and it also classifies major plants and animals. And people believe that actually there's essential shared features across every instance in either of these two moiety groups. So whether you're a human, an animal or a plant, everyone that's Kuyan shares some shared characteristic and everyone that's Karpai shares some shared essence. So these are classification systems for humans metaphorically or analogically extended to land in various ways or things inextricably associated with land. They're not stable classification systems, but they're indexically grounded to specific interactants. So, you know, not everyone can call that bit of land Pula. Not a woman wouldn't necessarily refer to that totem as an older brother. She'd usually pick an older sister term. So that choice of term is constantly shifting based on the interactants in that situation. And what we don't see is any within category use. So this is all across humans and land mapped together in this whole. And we never see kin relationships being used to map two chunks of land or two totems into a kin relationship themselves. Though this is found elsewhere in Australia where um, kin terms and kin dyads are used to describe associations between two places. All right. So we're going to leave that human classification system behind and go on to another um, fragment from the recording. And um, one of the most crucial thing that speakers, the most frequent things speakers do throughout this drive is they talk about the resources in the environment and the association between resources and places in particular. And um, they do what I call noticing and assessment sequences, where they um, notice a resource and then assess some positive attribute of it. And by doing so, they should have so they're, they're a good member of the community. They know what's important, and they know what's important about the exploitation of that resource. Now, these are not landscape categories per se, but the sequences um, typically embed a place name in them. 
because that association between resource and place is so crucial to them. So we'll just listen to this fragment. Minya is animal, Mai is vegetable food. So what they're doing here is they notice they're coming to a place, they call out the name, but watchy, watchy, it's the same place that we heard Dorothy talking about earlier when talking about a good positive place. Watchy, watchy, they call out, and then they start talking about the resources there. Oh, look there on top, on Minya there, which is like meat animal food. Oh, on top there, I think. Oh, it's got my vegetable stuff there. And then they start getting into, they're noticing a rainforest fruit and they start discussing the colour of the berries on it and disagreeing about it. And um, these, tri these are the most frequent thing that the speakers do throughout the trip. They're doing this every few minutes. And each of these noticing and assessment seekers ha sequences has this type of structure. Optional place name, where are we? solicit a joint attention between the interactants in the car using a look or a didactic form, point out the resource and then crucially notice an attribute of that resource. And there's loads of them all the way throughout. This top one there, a tree there, stand up, where Queenie Dorothy, um, Elizabeth says, Dorothy says there's a big one there. Now a tar a tree, the fruit becomes ripe when it's mature. So noticing it's big is crucial to the exploitation of the resource. Same for the next one down. Here, Yamajiko, which is a place name. Look, Karpai, which is a tree. Here, grow everywhere. Hey, look, all those young ones there. Now, a Karpai tree, the bark, bark fibre, is stripped and used to make grass skirts, and it must be young and fresh and supple. So what they're doing really in these sequences in pointing out the key thing that you need to know about this resource. And this sort of value placed on precise observations of plants and root descriptions has been noted elsewhere in Australia. And there's just this great quote here by David Nash talking about Walbury and Walman Park people in Central Australia. And he's saying, people use plant information as a basic mnemonic for places. They mark spots on the road, incidental spots on a well-known road. You know, they help to relocate a place. They almost use a gossip about a place. And we see much of this sort of same thing happening in this car trip as well, where here we come to a place, top crossing, now here top crossing, what animal food have we got here? And then they start discussing uh, what animal food is there. So this sort of like, what's coming up now thing and, and people displaying their knowledge of that place happens throughout. Okay, moving on to the next um, uh, little fragment from the recording. In this particular section, they're discussing whether the area we're passing through is ampulu or yari. Now, these are two soil terms, and, um, but they have extra associations. They're not just regular soil terms. They've got a bit of baggage that come with them. So ampulu is a, a sandy black soil, but it's metonymically used to refer to a habitat that is um, where it predominates. Uh, namely the sand dunes directly behind the coastline. And the same with Yarki, it's a white fine silka type sand and it's metonymically used, it extends to a habitat associated with this which is certain dune systems um, a little bit further inland in some areas. And so part of the disagreement that they're having here is about that and about some of the associations with these soil and these extended uses. And there's a complex set of, of soil lexicon of which a little bit's here and it really has got a lot of, there's a lot of distinctions based on coarseness and fineness, fine white sand, fine dust sand, different types of ripple. And so far several of these are attested to have this metonymic pattern where the soil type itself extends to a habitat associated with that. So pull il mud can be used for swamp. Ampulu I just discussed, black sandy soil, sand ridge country, Bhutaka, fine red soil, plain country associated with this fine red soil. And then Yar'i is a little bit interesting and that's part of the difficulty 
that the speakers had in that interaction, it's also a site name, a place name specifically, so it has three uses. It's a sand type, fine white silka sand. It's an area associated with sand dune systems and it's a place name for a specific place with mythological associations. And that's sort of the canonical, most powerful use of this term. And so on the car trip, when Susie says, oh, is it Yanti? She gets a little bit, Dorothy gets a bit concerned, well, it can't be because of these mythological associations, though it is fine and white um, in quality. And I've just got a bit of an excerpt here from an explanation of this um, mythology associated with this place. So it's a metamorphosis mythology uh, about a transformation of a diamond head stingray into white sand deposits in these amazing dune systems. They call its name Yagi. There it's white is from its stomach from the stingray. Um, this sort of shared names across different entities with the environmental world is rife throughout Umpala and Kuhiyatu. It's sort of like a zero derivation practice where the same term is used for multiple um, biota based on very shared characteristics. So echidna here, uh, ka'uma is echidna and porcupine fish, shared spikiness trait. Uh, up and stinging tree and jellyfish, shared stingingness trait. Um, ka'ku tree species and a fish species. That's based on um, the, the blossoms of this tree flower when the fish are good and fat for getting so for catching. So that's sort of a spatial continuity. But Yikin's a really cool one here at the bottom. It's the name of an acacia tree, the place associated with an acacia tree. No derivation required, just plain use. A spear made from that acacia tree, and then it's the root of a verb to straighten a spear in a fire. Now, this type of pattern has been noted in Australia before by Nick Evans, and it's been called sign metonymies, the sharing of names or at least roots between biological entities of patently different classes and even kingdoms on the grounds that one biological entity signals the presence or availability of another. And the most common one has been this fish tree example that I just pointed out, and it's noticed actually in many places in Australia and in PNG as well, apparently, too. Um, so also in Aboriginal Australia, if you work there for a little bit, you hear people use this expression, that plant is mate for that plant, or that, you know, animal's mate for that animal. They're mates for each other. And this is sort of like an ethno-semantic term that's about a relationship, once again, usually between two distinct biota. Now, Umpala and Kukia'u are unusual in the regard that they have a morpheme that formally expresses this relationship. And in this pair of two things that are mates, um, one of the, the, the mates is derived from the other using this form. So the word for sugar bag is puntu, but then the grass used to extract that sugar bag is puntu mulu. Yeah, oh, sorry, yeah, it's a type of honey. And so people want to scoop out the honey. It's very prized, it's very delicious. People, like, totally love it. Uh, the, grass and the, the grass is a mate for the sugar bag, and they refer to it by the same term. Pitul mulu uh, is a bird dwelling in mangroves, and pitul is the word for mangrove, and so it's a habitat association. And then there's other associations. This one's probably a mythological or totemic association, Malantachi Malu, which is lightning with Malu on the end, which refers to a soldier crab and a stick insect. Um, so some of them are a little bit difficult to tease out. Um, but what's interesting about Umplon Kukia'u is the formalness um, of this suffix. And unsurprisingly, we see it in estate names. We see it in landscape categorization as well using much the same pattern that we keep seeing again and again, where a key characteristic feature of a place lends its name to a whole. So in um, the top case here, pul'ununumulu, a water bird suffix with a locative and mulu, that water bird is predominantly associated with that estate. Mumu mulu, mumu is a key place within a particular estate, an extended area of land, and it lends its name to the whole, and so forth. 
All right, um, moving on. So I've got six vignettes. We're up to number four. So we're making our way through the trip. Um, so I did a lot of that. You know, I said I did a lot of work just sitting with people in the community, um, you know, asking them questions, trying to tease things out before I started doing these trips. And I got a really nice, neat mapping of ecozone or habitat terms. I petitions the whole space. People were confident with it. I was like, this is fantastic. There's an area for the outer reef, deep place. There's the beach zone. There's the, you know, the sort of intercoastal dune zone. And then you move backwards. And, and this was all great. Um, you can tell I'm building up to say, once you're out on country, people didn't really want to use these terms. In fact, what they wanted to is to productively create on-the-spot descriptions to describe a place based more on the task that was happening or something that was salient at the time. Um, and, uh, and these you know, terms don't exhaustively map across the territory. It's just not the way they work. They're just productive stuff, often based on plants once again, but all sorts of things. And um, an hour into this trip, Dorothy says, this one all call this one, Nachi, that's that word for place. She extends it as she thinks about what she's going to say. Tutu Ancha, which is scrub hen hole place. And then, oh yeah, hey, yeah, scrub hen hole place, yeah, 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 they all agree that's like fabulous, they think that's totally what it is, but you would probably never get that again for that place. Um, uh, and this type of reproductive um, pattern in ecozone terminology is also noted elsewhere in Australia, and I um, found that um, Nick. Evans, once again, was noticing this in um, Binum Gumwok. All right, so on to the fifth little fragment. Um, this one's on landscape features, which would be things like hill and mountain and creek and river in familiar languages like English. And if you look at a familiar language, European language, you might think that scale's going to be really important to these terms. Um, and that's much the received view within geography and, and um, sort of ge geographic sciences for sure. Um, but what I actually found here is that on this trip we're, we're pulling into a, um, to look at something on the side of the road, there's a mound of soil there that's been pushed up by the grader and you get the term that's also used for hill. Ilka, oh, yakai, watch out, oh dear, ni'i, here, ilka, we might slip down. So, oh dear, watch out, sort of exclamation, here's a hill we might slip down. But it's really just a small mound by the side of the road. And then, not that long later, you get the same term referred to as this massive, this is the Great Dividing Range, Ilka's applied to that as well. Um, here now we climb up on top of that wanim, that whatchamacallit now, Ilka, that hill. Kanimawathinya, we go up. Ilka, Kukanyuku now, that's a place name, and then they keep talking. So this term is really just a term for any elevated feature of any material or any um, scale. And many of the core landscape features in Umpla and Kukia'o are like this. So Maya, the word here which, you know, would be initially glossed as cliff, and if you looked in a dictionary or a set of old field notes, that's how it would be glossed. But when you work with speakers, you find actually just the smallest side of something that's vertical like this is Maya as well. Same for Muchi, the backbone of an elevated feature, an elongated elevated feature. Kulu is for any type of depression. It can be a hole, it can be a massive valley, it can be, you know, the, the, the deeper area of the outer reef um, and so forth. And this really speaks to the definition of landscape, the received definition of landscape as visually prominent, large scale and distal backdrop drop. Because of course, some of these smaller instantiations of these features could be kicked over with your foot or could disappear tomorrow. Um, so it's a slightly different view of, of landscape. All right, so the last little fragment. This is another thing, along with those noticing um, and assessment sequences that the women do, that is very common. They list place names. They list the places to come on the track. They list the places we've been. They repeat them and they collaboratively check the order and the relationship between the places. 
spatially, and this is very important, and they do this repetitively. And this is also a feature of narratives and songs. So it's not just a feature of being in situ, it's just a feature of that important, importance of the network of places rather than places viewed as an isolated name. And now, lots of people might be familiar with in Australia, there's this idea of a song line, which is a track associated with an ancestral being or a, a spirit and it moved across a place and it made various sites and created them and it's very culturally salient. And this track it moved is a song line and it often has a name and it has many names on it. These types of sort of very cosmologically important song lines do not exist in this part of Australia, not at all. There's not one instance of them. But what we do get is these well-worn paths of travel. It's a much more secular um, sort of system. And so let's play this fragment as they do a little bit of this place name listing. Danger Creek this side, Nunda that side, Nunda then Danger Creek, then your Magico, then Kukunyuku, then Kukunyuku, then Bald Hill and so forth. Up the rain. Um, so while we're on place names, let's look at how they're structured. These two, ex two of these examples here, two of the language place names, when you look at their composition, they're just using regular nominal derivational morphology. Commutative marker, genitive marker, nominalizer, um, just regular old stuff. And um, when doing a little bit of work on a corpus of 232 place names, you find this is largely the case. So there's lots of these bare nouns, like this is this zero derivation I keep talking about, where just a regular bare noun is used as a place name. So the, the noun here for cassowary is used for a place, a mountain, um, and an area associated with that mountain near the Lockhart River settlement. Wattle, a grass species, is also a point on a bay. And so this is quite common, 14% of the instances. Commutative marker, which is like a having type suffix, it's, this is really common right across Aboriginal Australia. People talk about it all the time. Plants associated, a name comes from a plant or a resource associated with a place. You stick the having suffix on it, it literally means place that has that grass, place that has that tree, and they're usually very transparent. Um, and usually there's a lot of that stuff at that place, so it's no surprise um, at all. Mm, there's a few instances of compounds and clauses. Um, what we do find is um, some special morphology, uh, making up 29% of this small corpus. Uh, and these two suffixes, remember us talking about those song lines and the movements of ancestral beings? Well, you don't get those song lines, those tracks of movement, but you do get the movement of ancestral beings coded in these suffixes. Muta is a place where an ancestral being sat down, and that place is named after it. Nunama is a place where that ancestral being travelled through. So the system doesn't totally disregard this pattern found elsewhere in Australia, but it just doesn't have exactly the same way that it expresses it. Um, there's a 24% unanalyzable names, and there's really varying, you know, this is a big thing in place name studies, right? You know, what's analyzable and what's not. So I tossed up some transparency figures, comparable ones in Australia. Really big variation. Uh, also depends on the number of place names you collected and how you get them, so it's a little bit of a funny um, thing. So I'm going to finish up on a really nice little bit of something that happens in the recording. Is throughout the trip they sing songs. And the songs are sparked off by, or are associated with places, and they're sort of sparked off from being in that place. And this song here is a song about Nunda, which is an outstation that you, you, we've just seen on the list of names, actually, that we pass. And an outstation is a place where men were often sent to, um, uh, you like, like, take care of livestock, cattle, um, and muster. 
and uh, this is about mm, 20 kilometres outside of the old mission um, site. And this song was composed by the uncle of Susie, one of the women in the car. And it's about leaving to go and work at the outstation Nanda. Daybreak we leave for Nanda, by and by they wait for us. You look from that hill to the deep blue outer reef. So that's, they're up on the Great Dividing Range on their way to that outstation and they can see out to the ocean and then he lists two names, the places you pass through. And as we go along the road and we're near this place, they start singing this song in snatches and it's sort of embedded in one of these lists of place names and includes a sort of list itself. Yeah, and after we're going to go for Kalpuchin Hill now, she starts talking about the next place we're going to go to, which is the place in the song itself. So just some final wrapping up comments. Um, you can see by doing these recordings um, and trying to get some situated, contextually rich information that there was a lot of um, Creole and Mission English in there, probably the majority, but it had rich documentary and descriptive value for really understanding how landscape languages are used and understanding some of the semantics of these traditional categories that were embedded within this um, uh, communicative event. And we also saw that landscape, to return to that question, what's the nature of landscape as a semantic domain, we saw that landscape was ultimately within Umpalura and Kuhia'u closely intertwined with the linguistic cl classification of plants, animals, human states, spiritual and cultural belief systems. So we again and again saw zero de derivation, metonymic uses, shared names across many different um, uh, types of biological categories and landscape features. And uh, this speaks to this cultural belief that I pointed to about this corporeal connection between humans and land of a sort of culturally assumed idiom whereby people in the environment are entities of one aspect of a greater whole. And uh, I'm not the first person to say this in Australia by any means, and here's a quote by David Wilkins talking about our notion of place, and he says here in the middle of this, going to the middle of this, the, um, uh, a name place is a point within a network of relations, and it's these relations that give it definition these relations are not only or even mainly with other places, but also with people and things through kinship and totemic affiliation. And these, the language reflects these associations in levels of lexicon, grammar and discourse, which is also what I believe is true for Umpala and Kukia. Oh. And yes, there we're arriving at the old site in this picture. And that's it. Yeah. Now this is, and, and this was a good mm. way of getting this a mm. very natural uh, mm. language use, which then which was mixed. Mm. And this is something I've been thinking about a lot. 
um, in the context of our own work on indigenous multilingualism mm. in small uh, societies. Because, so there as well, language is associated with land. So, meaning if you speak a language, well, it's basically, it's like, it's very similar to the Australians mm. who own a language. It I mean, sounds it's like it, yeah. So it is patrilineally passed down from, you know, and so people move, of course, and they speak other languages, which of course yeah. used yeah. to also be the case in Australia, at least until the very recent past. And so when you move in and you, you, you are interested in this language as, you know, the language of the land, mm -hmm. that is not what people actually speak. Yeah. So you really put them on the spot. Yeah. It's a register that is limited to particular contexts of ritual contexts, you know, with libation, sacrifice to the ancestors, mm, mm, spirits, yeah, you know, yeah, also yeah. associated with natural entities, etc. And it may happen that you have a family that's particularly homogeneous and that, that language is used mm. in, the right, in, in, in the variety of situations. But otherwise, language use is as pragmatic and mixed as you show yeah. in your recordings. So, that dualism is systematic as well because, mm. you know, through the association of languages with places, you also regulate the relationships between people, of course. Yes. You know, how people yeah. marry, how they have a right uh, to mm. pass through, etc. Um, and so that is something that I often find absent in language work. I'm getting to the end, mm. sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> really so far, I'm like, that. yes, yes, that all sounds very familiar and yes. like what and I documentation experience. And people think of, this language is endangered and we need to preserve it. And they think of reusing and revitalizing the, the, yeah. the language. But, it, and, but you cannot use the actual language used to revitalize that language. Yes. You know, because it's, it's a Because it's so mixed. Yes. The people don't yes. respond well to it as you to use it as a language revitalization tool. Yes, exactly. Yeah. People see that this is well, no no. That's not what I was trying to say. So let me try again. So what people often see endangered is the pure language that yeah. is associated with the land. But that mm -hmm. is to a large extent a fiction because yeah. the language so <coughs> It's a kind of prototype that's yeah. never fully instantiated. Yeah. Yeah. What is real is the language mix that reflects yes. the yes. many okay. relations that people, yeah. you know, who own different languages have with each other. Yes. And uh, but that you cannot use to virtualize the prototype. That's right, because of people's mean? yes. But at the same yeah. time, you know, if yeah. you, even if you yeah. try to yeah. extend the use of the prototype, yeah. <laughs> don't actually yes. protect the ecology, because it's yes. ecology, it's the sense, this network of relationships. Yes, I would totally agree. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yes, there was multilingualism in this area before. Yes, would the um, lots of the elders be comfortable with this material being used as a representation of mm -hmm. their traditional language categories? Not so much uncomfortable with it. Um, the fact that the recordings were so informal was the value of them. Mm -hmm. But if we were doing proper landscape work, and we once I get once we get to a site and I pull out the video camera, it's a whole different ball game. Things are rehearsed. People are very self-conscious because they're on record yeah. now, and there's a lot of cultural weight given to that, and they're worried about getting it wrong. Mm -hmm. Because they're especially because they're in situ. Remember everything I said about how important it is yeah. to foster that relationship with the land that's perceived as sentient, well, you don't want to get it wrong because then what are the consequences of that? So it's highly pressurised. So I have a lot of that, but I found it actually less rich and of less value than this. But that's the material that people would be like to have used that high cultural value, sort of high cultural prestige material. That's what people want for language revitalisation. But it's sort of the wrong way to go about it. There's got to be an element of that. But really what you want is the everyday locus of communication, interaction, and people to be comfortable with, you know, mixing things together, as would have been to some degree naturally the case. Um, yeah, yeah, that just all just totally rings true. And it's a difficult mix to, to, to deal with 
as a researcher and obviously you want to be doing a bit of all those things to get stuff for the community and also to get a, a good repertoire for your work as well. Um, but I really found like this was like the, the really the richest stuff. I felt like I really went further with the semantics and the true nature of the system and how everything hangs together through these recordings. Yeah. Hey. Um, Levinson, I think, wrote a paper on how uh, landscape naming and categorizing works in the Yeah. I'm, yeah. I was struck by how similar it was, that it was more shape related than really yeah. size and stuff. He has a similar term there, um, umbu, I think it is, which is just convex, elevated of any feature. Um, it's a little less extensive, actually, than umpala and kukiyao. Um, it's just a small set of terms, but yeah. Um, scale certainly isn't the main feature within that system, and he sort of overtly says that. So yeah. Is that an Australian phenomenon, or is that because they're not too far from Torres Strait? No, I'd say it's a wider phenomenon. If you actually look at the landscape language literature, then uh, Carolyn O'Meara working with the Seri um, of Mexico also notes the same phenomena. Um, uh, Loretta O'Connor working on, is it Chontal? Chontal? Yeah. yeah, she notes a very similar thing. You know, various people find it more systematic or not systematic, but this idea of scale not being a key semantic driving force in landscape features, I think actually if you did a proper um, typological survey, you'd find that more common than not, is my sense from it, yeah. Maybe I missed it, but um, when you talked about the listing, the mm. fire listing places, yeah. Yeah. which is a, it's a survival mechanism. Completely, um, yeah. That if you know the places and you yeah. know the right order, then you can, yeah. you can find where to get food and Yeah, and so yeah, on. yeah, and I'd agree. Probably the most <coughs> impressive example I've heard of is um, in the 1930s, Norman Tyndale was in the Simpson mm. Desert and met a group of Aboriginal people there. And he went, happened to go back a year later happened to run into uh, the same family mm. and they told him over 200 names of the places that they had been during the 12 yeah. months, yeah. Um, listing them off in exact chronological order of yeah. where they'd been. So, yeah. so I mean, you, you contrasted that to the song lines yeah. issue, but actually in yeah. all over Central Australia, from my experience, yeah. people know that it's yeah. names yeah. because that's where you, how you live. There's still travel routes, right? The water holes are usually in central Australia. They're usually, you know, they have these um, mythological associations and they're on a song line, but they're the place you travel and they're the place where you survive. Um, so, yeah, it's, it was a bit of a contrast, but really it's still a mnemonic for travelling um, and, and for survival and resources. Just one's a secular one with no associations and one is one that's really loaded with spiritual stuff. But ultimately, that sort of cosmological stuff still encodes resource information as well. It just has this other layer. So, yeah, I agree that it's a similar function. If I can just give yeah. one little anecdote. Yeah, yeah, the, great. The relations to the flora and fauna. Um, many years ago, I spent, I think it took us about two or three hours. We were going to a particular place. This was with Louise Focus. Mm. South Australia, and we walked around and around in circles with our Aboriginal guides getting more and more frustrated until finally one of the guys realised that there was a very large tree that had grown up since he had last been there, mm -hmm. and he was totally confused about where this place was because the tree what shouldn't have been there. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he figured that out, he, he literally he just stood there and he just bang and he just walked straight to where the place mm -hmm. was. So, really astounding to mm. see how they map the, yeah. you know, the flora in particular. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it looks like you've got a follow-up yeah, follow just to follow say. On, on that, yeah. yes. Um, so uh, many languages uh, in the area where I work have uh, non-classification mm. systems, and they incorporate, incorporate size and shape. And uh, so it's often said about non-class systems that they um, classify um, the nouns. Not mm -hmm. the referent. 
And that is definitely not true for anything, mm -hmm. particular for trees and plants that you know, are landmarks. So very often you ask, uh, so is this a tree? <laughs> you know, so is this a tree or is this a, a shrub? So different practices. But you have to show me the tree before I can tell you. <laughs> because um, they, they are really, and people uh, recognize protests that's also very well known among other mm -hmm. African societies. They, they recognize photo of the tree um, as you know belonging to the area. So you can never cheat if you uh, trying to do mm. an illustrated dictionary and try and <laughs> use uh, photos from another village only 20 kilometers away, but it was not acceptable. You know. Wow, that's really cool. Yeah, <laughs> it is like the trees yeah. are so. Yeah. Yeah, uh, amongst the Umpa and Kuhia, oh, I mentioned this sort of moiety group classification mm -hmm. and this Kuyin and Karpai group and, mm -hmm. and that people, plants and animals and land and everyone's thrown in together into these two groups and it sort of is this bilateral classification of everything that's meaningful about the world. Were these underlying folk beliefs about what organises this, part of it um, people point to things like tree bark and and striations on leaves and water quality associated with a place and they're things that are very small features of the element of the landscape that show patterns and then for humans they connect that to the lines on you know the palm lines on your hand or that a certain way and that makes you kuyan or karpai and that's a bit like the you know the pattern and the bark on the tree and mm -hmm. and the colouring of people's hair and the texture of it whether it's curly or not which is a thing in this area, that's also a thing and people are very key on these small differences because of their cultural salience as part of this big bilateral grouping um, that divides the world up. Okay, so um, uh, for most of them I had like a Garmin GPS, so I had a, a, a track log and I made points, waypoints along the way, so that's how I kept track of, of where we were. Um, I didn't video record it because it was, I would love to, but I need a proper grant where I can rig a car with proper things that video cameras clip into with a certain like fisheye lens and a certain angle. I didn't have the resources for that, so what I did was I had um, literally a Zoom audio recorder and uh, a JVC video camera. I didn't do any video, I just had the lens cap on. I had two Rode <coughs> microphones, good microphones with dead cats on them. And then I made them in two different locations in the car. I literally got like a photo um, uh, copy paper box, like a small box, and I put like towel and everything around them. Now, there was some overheating problems in, um, uh, at hotter times of the year doing this, but as a general rule, it didn't work, but I, it didn't cause a problem. But um, I just wanted to pat it from some of the corrugations and just make it a bit cocooned. And that seemed to work, you know, as long as the microphone was sticking out, the camera's protected, the microphone's sitting on a little, like, bed of stuff. It somehow seemed to, most of it was transcribable. Yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah. No. Yeah. But did you take like, pictures? Oh, I took some pictures out the window. Just yeah, period. yeah, you know, whenever I thought there was something important going on, a bit like the waypoint. But, you know, it's a bit haphazard. It's not full documentation of every element. It's just what we could do. We were on a genuine trip and there's other demands on that. Sometimes I'm driving, sometimes I'm not. You know, there's some things to attend to. You do what you can in between everything else that's going on. Um, it doesn't really, I ha haven't mined this data for grammar of space stuff, though you totally could, because there's heaps of it there. Um, so yeah, I haven't really interrogated it for that, but it's certainly present in the material. The system itself is not that far from Gugiyimidi, so it is one of these absolute, you know, spatial reference systems. Um, and, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. Hmm. How, how do you think these two projects um, might relate to each other? Um, well, 
Uh, obviously, you know, the sort of um, any sort of motion event or movement through space, the end point or the destination, that would be relevant to the sort of like just the analysis of it. But I can't off the top of my head, other than I'd say on the small scale aspect of it, the landscape features being right down to the small scale, well, that spatial reference system's the same. You know, this is famous in Aboriginal Australia that you can use directional terms right down to tabletop space. So this sort of disregard for scale um, and sort of that, you know, there isn't this geography, isn't this out there, distant, visually prominent thing, the same resources associated with that large scale geographical space are at work here on the tabletop or the small scale space or the, the campground where you're sitting. Um, I'd say it sort of fits into that whole model of what's going on where the, the, the version of landscape is a sort of unfamiliar one and it, it isn't carved out in the same way um, as, as we think it is in familiar languages. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm being interested in what's I'm also interested yeah. in the language mix and also in the transcription convention. Mm. Yeah, of course. The transcription conventions are a bit awful but in this. That is not awful, but I'm really interested in the kind of. Is that one okay? Um, is that one's boundaries not. That yeah. are often present mm. in transcriptions, and transcriptions mm. by different stakeholders because they tell us so much about language yeah. technologies. So, um, not being judgmental, but no. just looking at this of course. really interesting research question. Um, so, what I see. Mm. By partition yeah. between something that is English, although you said it's Creole and it's old mission English, but yeah. it's not standard English probably yeah. spoken in there, and then something that is Aboriginal. Yeah. So that's very interesting because that's a very standard mm. liter literacy convention. Mm. Mm. So you use the standard, the written standard as your lead. Yeah. And you and mm. then you have a bifurcation, mm. you know, you have one standard. Mm that is very well established for Australian languages and then one mm. standard that is established for English. Now, I was wondering, do you ever had an uh, instance where um, people themselves did transcribe discourse? No, no. there's no, um, there's no one yeah. with any literacy in the traditional language or in Creole, actually, because yeah. it's not an officially knowledge form. Yeah, but I mean, form. So for instance, in, in the project we work on, um, we train transcribers and people also go to school and, and our yeah. Yeah. And then they use the standard literacy that yeah. they have learned and transfer it. Yeah. So they use one leader, what you would be yeah. for yeah. English versus uh, yeah. Australian kind of. Yeah. And so then all the boundaries disappear because yeah. they use one lead standard for all yeah. for yeah. the entire world. Yeah. Which is really interesting, um, in terms of mm. what it means as to the ontological status of Yeah, for sure. In the mix. For sure. I haven't actually, um, in this, these transcripts, tried to tease apart the three varieties, mm -hmm. in part because mm -hmm. it's it really, it's impossible yep. to do that. Mm -hmm. And also, there isn't um, been any research on the Creole. Mm -hmm. I hope to be doing that myself shortly. But um, so there isn't an orthography in a way to represent it. So the Creole forms, things that I know are, you know, as best I can in the messiness of this say well that's emerged as part of the creolization process that form uh, they're not they are represented using more English type writing which is highly problematic um, but I mean it's interesting because we have linguists you know we always yeah. Um, so yeah. you could use the IPA and just transcribe everything using one yeah. standard but we, we yeah. have this obsession with boundaries right even yeah. though maybe yeah. they are not really present yeah, 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 I'd agree, mm -hmm. I'd agree, yeah. No, but I'm, I mean, I was asking what they are doing, so I'm not saying yeah, that was the point, I was reporting my, my case, and I was asking what people were doing, so I wasn't assuming that they would not. They don't, re yeah, they don't really have any knowledge <laughs> of the, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In this community, the term Creole is only about familiar for two or three years, actually. Um, 
uh, and it's not, it's just people are just starting to recognise what they're speaking is a little bit different and actually people that know, sorry, Denise Angelo is in part re responsible for this growing awareness because she was working um, for the Queensland Education Department and going up into Cape York and there is some growing sense that people are saying, and when politicians come, people in recent years, even before the, the term Creole started to gain some use amongst community members, people did start to recognise that what they spoke was really, really not commensurate with English and that they would, you know, when politicians came, they would do something in their way of speaking, they'd say, and then, you know, into uh, big English or standard English. So there is a little bit of acknowledgement of that amongst uh, the sort of community leaders of the community, but outside that context, there's virtually no awareness of this. There's awareness that people don't speak the traditional language and the older people um, are able to switch into the traditional language or were when there were more of them. Um, but yeah, there it's, it's different, yeah. If you can just come up, I find it interesting yeah. to mention uh, the Yeah. Because she was around the right yeah. I think that's eventually going to happen. It's, it's starting to, the beginnings of it becoming politicised and awareness is starting to happen in this part of Cape York. And of course people are having more, the, 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 the schools having more interaction with um, the Torres Strait as well. There's a little bit more connection in, the, in, a, in a current scheme going on within the education department and this might be facilitating some of that awareness too. in some places but I think that the observation of this in Central Australia as being a key part of, of what's happening there makes it unlikely that all of it's accountable to that but there may be elements of that for sure for sure but the, it's yeah systematic present through Australia and also the uh, our understanding of how uniform semantics are through Pamanuan languages in Australia and even non Pamanuan languages provides a good indication that this is a natural part of the system. Yeah, I think so. Story, yeah, yeah. Well, there's such patches of work, but I would like to do a bigger typological <laughs> thing actually on some of this stuff. But there's little things, you know, but you have to dig a bit, like it's in a grammar or in a paper, it's a section of it. Um, so, yeah, a little bit of a collation of some of those patterns. And of course, most of the landscape stuff's focused on place names um, in Australia, of which there is lots of similarities. Um, with too. But yeah, I find that's why I dropped in those little hints of where I'd noticed in the literature similar things being noticed elsewhere in Australia because I'm curious on how widespread that is. And also it creates like things like, you know, in response to the last question, it helps bolster the sense interpretation of the data too. So. Occasionally took handwritten notes, but to be honest, these trips were usually my duties were um, a multi-role sort of duties, and I usually didn't have much time to take notice. 
because like people were saying, pass me a mandarin as I was going, oh no, the tape's about to run out and I need to do that. I've got a stopwatch going for when the tape runs out so I can change it, things like that. So it was usually notes were limited on these trips, but in other situations, um, notes, uh, lots of notes when things were perhaps less appropriate to start recording straight away. Like for instance, you get to, well, you're doing one of these sort of more formal recordings in site somewhere and people are just sort of like warming up and they're not comfortable to have the recorder on yet. Well, I'm trying to get what I can down in a notebook because that's a little less intrusive, but actually that negotiation of it is what I really, really want to record, but are sort of un unable to most of the time. So a mix depending on the pressures on me, what I can do. Usually though, I, um, in that case, I would try to write them up very quickly because usually mostly when I'm taking notes, um, I usually I'm under pressure and they're quite messy. And so all these beautiful written hand notes I look at from anthropologists and people that work daily in the field, I don't know how they did it, but you know, mine are like illegible to me a week later. So it's like later that night I'm at home at 11 o'clock at night, bleary eyed, and 